would be the faith of my future. But as a young woman, I never could have imagined where my faith would take me. When I was a young nun, it was simple. What counted was a personal relationship with God, inner peace, kindness to others, and heaven when life is done. In 1980, my religious community, the Sisters of St. Joseph, made a commitment to stand on the side of the poor. And I had gone along, but reluctantly. I didn't want to struggle with politics or economics. We were nuns, after all, not social workers. Even Jesus Christ himself had said, the poor you will always have with you. That all changed in June 1980. Some glaring injustices were pointed out to me by a sociologist, Sister Mary Augusta Neal. The poor aren't there magically. The poor are poor as a result of specific business decisions, specific oppression, and specific greed. Poverty is no mistake. It is put there by those that benefit from it. But what can I do? I'm just one sister. The problem is now. No, how is that a problem? Well, now you've got to do something about it, don't you? I'm not a political person. I don't get involved with politics. To be apolitical <coughs> in the face of injustice is a very political position to take. To not actively fight against injustice is to actively condone it. Once you understand something's wrong, you have to do something about it. Jesus preached good news to the poor that they are to be poor no longer. I didn't know much about the death penalty at this point, but I did know enough to assume that anyone occupying a cell on Louisiana's death row did not come from money. So I saw getting involved with this as a logical extension of our work with the poor. That evening, I wrote Matthew Ponsolet, prisoner 18375 at Angola's prison death row. I told him about myself, my family, the neighborhood I lived in. As I lay in bed that evening, I heard gunshots. I wondered who had gotten sucked into the violence tonight in St. Thomas Project. Who would be missing from school tomorrow? Which mother's wail would pierce the night? Two weeks later, a letter arrived. Dear Sister Prejean, Thank you for writing to me. I'm writing to you from my home, my six by eight foot cell. I'm in here 23 hours a day. We don't work on death row. We're special here. They keep us away from the general population. We're the elite because we're gonna fry. It's hard not to get soft in this cell. I press my foot locker, lift it, try to get my muscles in shape, but it's hard not to get fat. Rice, potatoes, pancakes, and beans. Sometimes I feel like a sow on a farm that's being fattened up for Christmas slaughter. Remove any metal, coins, keys. Matthew Ponsonwood. I remember him from the news. Him and another fella shot two kids in the back of the head on Lover's Lane. Raped the girl and stabbed her several times. Do you know what you're getting into? So what is it, sister? Morbid fascination? Bleeding hot, sister thing. No, you wrote me and asked me to come. There is no romance here, sister. No Jimmy had me. I've been wrongfully accused if only I had somebody who believed in me nonsense. This is a bunch of con. They will take advantage of you every way they can. You must be very, very careful. Do you understand? Yes, Father. These men don't see many females. Wearing the habit would help instill respect for you to flout authority. It will only encourage them to do the same.
Matt Ponsolet's file was a grim and unimaginable trip through a terrible nightmare. The depths of the depravity stunned me. A vicious, violent act, grief stricken parents, and unbelievable arrogance on the part of the Asian murderers. How lean and I read through it stopped. On Friday night, Walter Delacroix, age 17, and Hope Percy, 18, had been just two happy people celebrating one of life's turning points. The couple had been shot twice at close range in the back of the head with a 22 caliber rifle. In addition to murder charges, Ponslet and Patello faced six counts of aggravated kidnapping and one count of aggravated rape. Ponslet and Patello, posing as security guards, would handcuff the men and molest the women. Most of the couples were too ashamed to come forward. Patello drew his hand menacingly like a knife across his chest when Joseph Dunham appeared in the courtroom. In the four weeks before the murders, the two accused men allegedly had cut a wide path of terror across the area, attacking several teenage couples in local lovers' lanes. A police spokesman said today that in the wake of the killing, several couples have courageously revealed what happened to them and have identified Ponsolet and Vitello as the assailants. Matthew Ponsolet addressed the judge's cap and smirked when the jury found him guilty of murder here today. When Dunham's girlfriend appeared, a young woman Ponsolet had allegedly raped, he winked and blew her a kiss and told his weeping mother to dry up as he was led from the courtroom. I wondered about the parents, condemned to imagine that for the rest of their lives their children's last 200 hours perpetually startled out of their sleep by dreams of the terror that took their children from them. Voices heard in her ma sobbing and lamenting, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they were no more. The execution, which was originally scheduled for midnight, was dramatically halted as Tobias approached the chair. Tobias returned to his cell and he waited for it being discussed. At 1 a.m., the convicted murderer was removed from his cell and brought once again to the electric chair where he was executed. Tobias was pronounced dead at 1.15 a.m. Tobias would be one of the last to die in Bruce McGurdy, the state's electric chair. Two executions scheduled in the next five weeks will usher in the use of lethal injection in the state of Louisiana. Lethal injection is said to be a more humane method of execution. This is Aggie News. These happy days are yours and mine. These happy days are yours and mine. Happy days. Zap! Good night, Mr. Tobias. You should have messed around with the state of Louisiana. That's mad at me from the six. Sometimes I want to pretend that I'm not his mother so people won't leave me alone, not hate me. That's terrible, huh? It's a lot you're asking of yourself. Remember the story of Peter and the cox brother? He did not Jesus. That was a good friend of Jesus, someone he trusted. The rock of the church. He was scared. It's hard when everyone is screaming for blood. The boys are having a hard time at school. Everybody's picking on them, beating them up, calling them dates. Someone put a dead squirrel in little Troy's locker. He came home crying, poor baby. What did he ever do to anybody? I keep trying to figure out what I've done wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, why is the state call for the death penalty in the case of Matthew Ponslet? Well, let's take a look. In your files, you'll see pictures from the murder scene, pictures that testify to the proud de depravity and degeneracy of this most brutal and subhuman act of violence. It has been six years since the murders of Hope Percy and Walter Delacroix, and justice is long past due. Matt Ponslet has had a lengthy, thorough court review, not only a trial, but a retrial, as well as numerous appeals to state and federal courts, and successive petitions filed by Mr. Bob. Quite obviously, a most excellent attorney at the service of Mr. Ponslet. There has been no doubt in the court's mind at any time about who did the murder. The death penalty. It's nothing new. Been around for centuries. Used to nail people's hands and feet to wood, lash their sides and bleed them. Throughout the centuries, we buried people alive, lopped their heads off, guillotined them, and burned them in public with gruesome spectacles all. In this century, in the search for more humane ways to execute, we have shot people in firing squads, hung them from gallows, suffocated them in gas chambers, and cooked them alive in the electric chair. Well, 
We've got something even more humane now. Lethal injection. <coughs> Matthew Ponslet was not a good boy. He was the hottest killer. These murders were calculated, cruel, and disgusting. This man shot Walter Delacroix two times in the back of his head, and then raped Hope Percy and stabbed her 17 times before shooting this sweet girl two times in the back of her head. Since murder, Matthew Ponce has shown no remorse. In the courtroom, when he was sentenced, he was smiling and chewing his gum. He is an unfeeling, perverse mystic, and it's time, way past time, for him to pay the consequences of his horrifying deed. Lethal injection. He's trapped the guy up. Anik decides him with shot number one. Then we give him shot number two, that implodes the lungs. And then shot number three, that stops his heart. Put him to death like an old horse. His face just goes to sleep, while inside, his organs are going through Armageddon. His muscles would seize up and twist and contort and pull. But shot number one relaxed those muscles. So we don't have to see the horror show. We don't have to taste the blood of ruthlessness on our lips. While this human being's organs writhe and twist and choke, we sit there and nod our heads and say, justice has been done. What we have to ask ourselves is, what kind of justice has been done? I have already shown you how inadequately prepared Matt's lawyer was. I have documented procedural errors. When he wasn't sleeping, Matt's lawyer raised one objection. One objection. What kind of justice are we supporting here today, ladies and gentlemen? Del Cruz and the Percy's will never see their children graduate from college. They will never attend their wedding. They will never have Christmas with them again. There will be no grandchildren. They will bear this grief for the rest of their lives. And all they ask of you is simple justice for their unbearable loss. We have responsibility to these families and responsibility to society at large to show that horrible crimes have horrible consequences. It is only through deterrence that we can prevent this happening again. I ask you to take a breath, steal your spine, and proceed the execution of Matthew Posse. The state of Louisiana does not have to kill Matthew Ponsley to protect its citizens. This man is locked away for the rest of his days in Angola prison. He is not getting out. We can protect society without imitating the very violence we seek to eliminate. Please, let us have dignity. Please, let us not be complicit in the butchery of another human life. I am going to the chair, Dad. You're gonna fry! I'm gonna watch you sizzle! A policeman was right near me. I could have taken his gun and shot him right there. I could have killed him that day. I should have. I'd be a happier man today. It's nice enough. I've been hearing some disturbing things about you. Such as? That you're too emotionally involved with Matthew Ponslet and unable to fulfill your function as spiritual advisor. What gives you that idea? You fainted in the death house and caused a lot of commotion for my personnel. Fainted out of hunger, not emotion. As warden, one of my major responsibilities in the execution process is seeing that the condemned inmates get good spiritual counsel, a chance to get right with God before they die. This man Fall is perfectly capable of that. And doesn't trust Chaplain Farley. He has the right to choose his own spiritual counsel, doesn't he? Yes. It's guaranteed in the Constitution, isn't it? Yes, it is. But according to the Constitution, we can bar a spiritual advisor from the death house if they're a threat to prison security. A threat? 
were with some protesters outside the prison last night. Uh, come on now, I was singing Kumbaya. You may not like having me around, but you know I'm not a threat to pr prison security. Or if this man is going to die tomorrow, doesn't he have right to some solace? The hymn is nice, but it'll stir up emotion. I can't let you play it for Mr. Ponsel. As for the other thing, I don't want to get into a debate about the Constitution. You can continue to see. Thank you. Is this family going to be there tomorrow? Yes, sir. It's important that they're there for him. And you, Warden? You'll be there too? Yes, ma'am. All day and all night. Sister, no one's doing handstands about this execution. It comes with the job. A couple of hours passed. Vast expanses of silence. Each quiet moment, I felt I was failing you. I talked about trivial things, anything, to keep the silence away. The polygraph operator arrived at 10.30. Matt sits at a table with the polygraph operator. Any word from the Fifth Circuit? None yet. A good sign. They've had it a while now, and maybe that means they've found something substantive in the petition. I've got to go. All right. Tell me something, sister. What's it look like you doing in a place like this? Shouldn't you be teaching children? Don't you know what this man has done? The kids he's killed? Well, if he was involved in his evil, don't condone it, I just don't see much sense in doing the same to him. Oh, well, you know what the Bible says, an eye for an eye. And you know that Jesus called for us to go beyond that kind of vengeance, not to pay back an eye for an eye, not to return hate for hate. I ain't gonna get it all in this Bible court with a nudge, because I'm gonna lose. <laughs> You know something? The Bible also calls for death as a punishment for adultery, prostitution, homosexuality, profaning the Sabbath, trespass upon sacred ground, and contempt of parents. Really? Yes. Prostitution? You sure about that? Sure. <laughs> the clock reads 2.15. Another hour passed and Matt's family arrived. The welcome sound of laughter fell on the death house. <laughs> I can't believe that. She was only on the phone a few minutes, and there she was, falling for the old Matt charm. I just take back that phone. I'm trying to steal my gal, you dog. She sounds like a great little lady. <laughs> she ain't so little. Oh. <laughs> uh, don't do nothing stupid, Mitch. You take good care of her. You know, she looks a lot like a... What was that girlfriend you had in high school? Well, I had a lot of girls in high school. Ah, uh, Maddie, or Molly, or... Madrigal. <laughs> Madrigal Parmalee. Oh, man. She was hot. She was a nasty one. Woo, boy! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mama. Madrigal Parmalee was a fine, upstanding young woman. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Troy? You got yourself a little girlfriend? I don't have time for girls. Too much fishing and camping to do. Troy just got a new tent. What kind of tent you got? Armor tent? I don't like those sissy tents with all them colors. So not about that in the backyard. <laughs> Can't be in the backyard. I made him come in. I was worried. I went outside and I made him come into the house. So? Me and my buddy Paul put up the tent and cooked our own dinner. We roasted these potatoes and tin foil on the fire and cooked us some weenies. And then what happened? Shut up. Come on, <laughs> tell him. That been out of here, some kind of animal walking around, making noises. Big, strange animal, big and nasty. <laughs> well, wait, Jesse. Did you come inside because of Mama? Or because he was wigged out? <laughs> tell the truth now, tell the truth. <sighs> some people have been asking about your death, when your funeral's gonna be. And I just, I get real angry and I tell him, he's not dead yet. Another hour passed. Interminable silence followed by recollections, family snapshots from a time of less trouble and heartache. Memories that momentarily lifted the dark cloud that hung over this room. I'm sorry, folks. We're gonna have to wrap this up. Already? Rules say they can stay until 6.45. It's time for you folks to be leaving. Look, 
I put all my stuff in two pillowcases, and I feel a lot better if you all took it home with you now. I don't want the prison to send it. Step back to the wall. Mitch, you all can see about dividing it up. Except my boot for marrying here. I'm going to walk to my execution in these here boots. No crime. No crime. I don't want no crime. I'm not telling you all goodbye yet. I'll call you tonight. Can't she hug him? I'm sorry, ma'am. Security. See you, man. Stay strong. We love you, Maddie. No crime. I'll call you tonight. I'll call you. Dad, come on. I was around my boy. No God can't got me to let go. Is my mama okay? Yes, Matt. Next hour was the longest hour I've ever experienced. Not a word was said, the silence making each moment linger. Every second was a second less for Matt, and I wanted desperately to talk, but nothing came. Until the meal. The last meal. <coughs> These shrimp are pretty good. So, what's the word on that lab tech test? Hope said your answers showed stress just like he had predicted. He said the results were inconclusive. Bam! Is the dude sure? Is he absolutely, positively sure? I felt cool answering all them questions. Man, I can't believe I failed that test. Dad, you'd have to be a robot or insane not to feel stressed now. Man! I can't believe that test didn't come out right. Let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about that right. Well, I don't want to talk about it. I'm pissed off. I'm pissed that those kids are being popped out of the woods. I'm pissed that their parents are coming to watch me die. I'm, I'm pissed that Mattel got over on them kids. I don't let that happen. But I got my last words. And I got a thing or two to say to Della Cross and the Percy's. Do you want your last words to be words of hatred? Clyde Percy said he wants to inject me himself. Think about how angry he must be. He's never going to see his daughter again. He's never going to love her, laugh with her. You've robbed these parents of so much, Matt. They've got nothing in their lives but sorrow, no joy. That's what you've given them. What possessed you to be in the woods that night? I told you, I was stoned out of my head. Now don't claim the drugs, Matt. You've been harassing couples for weeks before this happened, months. What was it? What do you mean? What was it? Did you look up to Patello? Did you think he was cool? Did you want to impress him? I don't know. You could have just walked away. I told you. He went psycho Stop away. blaming him. You blame him. You blame the government. You blame the drugs. You blame the blacks. You blame the person. You blame the kids for being there. What about Matthew Consulate? Where is he in this story? Just an innocent? Just a victim? I ain't no victim! Consulate. Any last words, Councilman? Yes, sir, I, I do. Mr. Delacroix, I don't want to leave this world with any hate in my heart. It was a terrible thing I've done to taking your son away from you. I ask for your forgiveness. How about us? Mr. and Mrs. Percy. I hope my death gives you some relief. I just want to say, I think killing is wrong. No matter who does it. Whether it's me, or y'all, or your government. The gurney adjusts. The nurse checks the needles. The warden nods to the executioner. A switch is flipped. <coughs>
once said, if we were all to take an eye for an eye, the world would be blind. Jesus Christ showed us that the only way to stop the mad circle of violence and, and retribution was through love and reconciliation. Grijan opens a box. It is Matt's personal effects. She takes the boots out and sets them on the floor. Then a Bible. Love? Love for everyone, even those that inflict pain. For the family of a victim, this is an emotion that seems unattainable, impossible. But perhaps there is redemption and reconciliation. Perhaps there is some peace in not letting the hatred overtake you, and not letting those that have hurt you continue to after they're gone. If we reconcile, do our memories of our loved ones fade? Or do we honor our loved ones with a wish for everlasting peace? A holy place without violence, hatred, or revenge. Only time will tell. A week after we buried Matt, Mr. Delacroix asked me to meet him at a chapel near where the murders happened. Hey. I'm glad you're safe. I you know this I was. It's good to see you, Mr. Delacroix. Er. Shall we get started? This man must do that. <laughs> 